Hello, Rabbi Akiva. Why are we still here? Better question. Why are you not here? Better question. Why am I still awake? That's your problem. For the viewers, they may not know this. There's no reason they would. This is mine and Daniel's fourth meeting today. <laughs> fourth separate meeting about different topics. <laughs> Believe Which it. Which one's your favorite? We should start sending feedback surveys to each other. Like, how would you <laughs> rank this meeting? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want my ratings. You don't want those. <laughs> not publicly. <laughs> Welcome back to the schmooze. That's your line. You take it away that way. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's uh, Welcome to the Shmooze. So good to be here with all of you and Rabbi Akiva as we schmooze about all that's going on in the Jewish world and uh, really a focus for Jewish youth, Jewish teens, college students, for them to really connect to what they might not know about, to connect to Judaism, the pro-Israel movement, a uh, great place to get all of your information. On that note, we are so thankful to our sponsors this week, Mahon Mayan, an amazing seminary here in Israel on a beautiful campus for students who they want to really develop, they want to learn more about their Judaism. I love everything everything they do, and we know the staff there very well, but their tagline really says it all, this seminary that engages every aspect of who you are. They're not asking you to change, they're asking you to just be better, to grow with them, and they're happy to provide all the amazing resources to make you successful in whatever way you want to you wanna go in. So thank, we're thankful to them. Please visit their website, machonmayan.org. It's on the banner at the bottom, and you should uh, explore all the options of, of growth at Machon Mayan is a great place to start. 12th grade uh, girls who are listening, seriously, I have sent, I don't even know how many students, Daniel, I'm sure you as well, to Machon Mayan, and every single one, bar none, has had an incredible experience um, uh, uh, throughout their entire year. To the parents and educators listening, uh, as an educator, I'm not a parent of a 12th grade girl yet, um, but I do, my girl is, she's two. So we have some time. We're turning three this month. Um, and, uh, and so, but honestly, like they're just so communicative. Um, uh, they're, they're like, they're, they're so helpful. They're so supportive. Um, honestly, yeah, I only have good things to say to them about them and, uh, go to their website. Like if you really, if you really don't believe that, okay, they, don't, they can't engage every aspect. They really do. Like look at all the things they do from chesed internships to trips, uh, chesed internships to trips to the, obviously to the learning. Um, uh, it's a beautiful campus. Um, on a, just uh, a huge thumbs up. If we ended the show right now, that would be the best place to end the show because it's just Mahon Mayan. Incredible. Right. I and you seem to be slightly exhausted. But other than that, I think we um, should end up the following line I'd go there if I was a girl. Everyone should remember that. No. Don't. <laughs> there needs to be like more of a filtering process for you this late at night. I don't, I don't know if my software has any filters. What moving, are, what on to, yeah. <laughs> moving on to better news. Um, there are a couple things that, that, that came to mind over the past, over the past couple, um, couple months, you know, when we, a couple months, a couple days, um, when it's, it's been a long month this week. Um, so, <laughs> so Good one. Um, but thanks, thanks. It's definitely not original at all. Um, so, <laughs> so, on on a happy on a happy note, over a million people in Israel have been have been vaccinated. Um, for my uh, parents, uh, shout out mom and dad. Wow, Mazda, Mazda, really amazing. And I think it's also you know there's a there's a big debate. I don't understand in America happening now. Um, and we're not going to get into politics, so we'll go into our next topic in just a second. But but like vaccines are going to waste in America. Like mom is being thrown out. Well, that was. Case of someone who threw out like 500 vaccines was is it no, no, no. I'm not saying like intentionally. Like the vaccine doesn't last doesn't last so long. It has to stay in negative 40 degrees Celsius. Um, like the refrigerator, I guess. I guess that's a freezer at that point. Um, and then once you once you remove it, it it has a it has a clock on it. You can't put it back. So you're you're removing these vials to to administer vaccines, and then well, if you don't use it in time, you have to throw it out. Like you, it it does have a, a significant expiration on it. So, but because of state guidelines, the only like the at the it's like tiers. So not anybody can get a vaccine. Right. You have to you have to be in a certain group, a healthcare worker over the age of sixty five, depending on the state, whatever. But if those people, if they're not signing up for the vaccine, then they're like, you just removed all this vaccine. You don't have enough people filling your docket to administer it, so you can't just offer it to the general public. So in Israel, it's the exact opposite. They, you fill you fill the appointments, whatever appointments aren't filled. I think at 10 p.m. a lot of the kupotir will put out will put out a message. Look, we have like 300, 300 vaccines left. 
um, first come first serve, whoever whoever's here. And people are lining up every night, just hoping to get like it's a quick wow. jam. It doesn't it doesn't take so much time. So a million people over the course of two weeks. It's really, we're we're getting about one hundred fifty thousand a day. So it's, shot, it's really shot, a shot, shot, it's, shot, shot. yeah exactly exactly it's a modern day marvel and it's really it's really incredible to see how the country like they value life so much. You know, God forbid one vaccine should go to waste. It's uh you yeah. know it's a it's amazing opportunity. Israel is great in crisis because we're always in crisis. We're always in, in in you know there's no PTSD for Israel. It's just always TSD. Or everyone just has PS, PTSD. Moving on, please. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, yeah. A movie this week, twice already, because I have kids, called Soul. Have you watched it? Ooh, I, I am in the middle of it. I'm so excited because I, I think this is like a movie with tremendous depth. And I think, I think it just has the opportunity. Like, if you really spend time processing the, the messages, it's, it's unbelievable. I've, I mean, like kudos to Pixar and the team that are that made amazing graphics and and the whole stick, but also just the the ideas that they're trying to impart about happiness and right. following your passion and identifying your purpose. Yeah. Like I, I think it's uh, it checks so many boxes of what we try of we try. I mean, in a little bit of a different framing. Um, I'll tell you the only. Yeah. Thing, I mean, I loved it, and and I think that they're going to make Torah classes about it, like they did the Matrix. Like I think Soul is going to be something you can really make some Torah classes on. Daniel, you should totally, totally do that. Um, but, uh, okay, yeah. I I know you're already on. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, I only have one beef with that movie. There's only one part. Only I one. Oh, I mean, there are parts that like maybe aren't you know whatever. No, only one. Only one part that I really didn't like that I actively disliked. Okay. I don't like how they portray heaven. They portrayed it as you're going on this escalator and there's this big white light and then it, and it's like this, you know, it kind of reminds you of like a fly hitting like those blue lights and like zapping out of existence. I didn't like that. Like, I don't say, I don't, I'm not saying they have to have God in it or like a heavenly space or anything like that, but, but the, the sound of a, an electrical buzz like just makes it seem very negative, and that's and then he freaks out and he starts running the other way because like he's getting zapped out of existence. I'm not a fan. Yeah, of that. I, I mean, like I didn't I didn't play into the whole like this is heaven and there's like the great what they call the great beyond in the movie. Like I don't. There's definitely like obviously we have a different perspective of the afterlife and the before life or wh whatever you know whatever that shtick is. I happen to love from a sticky perspective. I love the administrators. <laughs> like just the Jerry? like the people who uh, Jerry. Oh, oh, hi, like, Jerry. hi Jerry. Hi Jerry. I connect so much to these people who are just like administrating heaven. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's probably um, like I can get behind that. I'm sure we have angels, administrative angels. <laughs> like the 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 abacus. Like like <laughs> yeah. I I get you. Um, so, so who are you? Are you Jerry or are you Jerry? Daniel. Terry kind of took on, and I don't want to spoil the movie in any way. Terry kind of took on a different personality than I thought she would take on. I'm definitely her in the beginning. No Terry doubt. Terry's a guy. Te okay, a guy then. No. I think he's a guy. I don't know if they have gender. They yeah. don't have gender. Yeah. Um, well, perfect movie for your, for your group. Um, but anyways, no, it's it's really, I'm not going to spoil the movie for anyone. I think it's definitely, I think it's definitely worth, you know, not just watching, but really thinking about, you know, it's it's the idea of like identifying your purpose, identifying what you want to get out of out of your life here and how, how you can, uh, and I think the movie does an amazing job towards the end um, as I'm felt going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> but of, of really trying to develop, like what the, what's the message, you know, cause, cause you go in thinking, you go in thinking a very specific set of ideas and then you kind of need to expand your, expand your mindset about right. what you're, what you're supposed to accomplish here, what you bring to the world. So um, with that, I'm, I'm very excited to, to bring on our speaker. It's definitely, um, I think so appropriate as, as we discuss this model about what you're what you're contributing to society. You know, today's guest is is Mo Mernick. Mo, Mo Mernick is a, a notable entrepreneur, speaker, author. You name it, he does it. Um, but I keep it one new title because I know you actually take part in in a couple of his programs. So a little bit of the background before we bring him on. Mo and I really got to know each other at a uh, Shabbaton a weekend retreat with 800 Russian people. Uh, it was through an organization called Limud FSU, which brings uh, together Russian Jewish people from uh, all over the globe. This was a Bay Area one with literally almost a thousand people. Natan Sharansky was there. Uh, it was it was there was a a chess master there who played sixty games of chess at once, and I think he won them all, uh, including against Natan Sharansky. Um, 
And uh, it was just an amazing, amazing Shabbaton. And they flew in Mo to speak at the Shabbaton. Me and him ran a lot of the youth programming together. And we really got to know each other. He's, he's just an incredible person who is always seeking, always striving for excellence, always see, uh, seeking to think outside the box um, and inside the box. Um, and uh, going back to Meira Spivak's uh, sponsorship a few episodes ago. And uh, he started his own uh, startup, uh, Windfluencers, like you had mentioned. Um, uh, uh, he uh, worked at NCSY. Uh, I don't know if you had mentioned or not. Um, uh, he wa- he acted in movies uh, in a TV show with uh, Drake called um, I don't remember what it was called. D- Derek Dayas here. Some Canadian thing. I don't like know. Canadian. It's a different language. And um, and uh, yeah, he's just an incredible person. And and other than what he's done, it's who he is. You just like I used to hang out with him in Ramat Shemesh a little bit. And he's just someone who's just so nice and fun and inspiring to be around. He he, he writes for the Mishpacha. If you get the, if you read for anyone who reads the Mishpacha, he does a daily minute, uh, one minute ins- inspirational video. We'll post a link to that. Um, he's just great. Let's bring him on. He's Let's back. Bring him on. Without further ado, Mo Mernick, welcome to the Shmooz. An unbelievable partner for innovation in the Jewish world. Mo, welcome to the Shmooz. Thank you, Daniel. It's awesome to be here. Thank you, Rabbi Kiva. It's such Ooh. a privilege to be with you guys. Thank you for coming on, Mo. Good to see you. I don't know if everyone knows, but Mo and I were kind of neighbors-ish. We lived in the same city for a time. As in Israel, it's basically neighbors because the cities are yeah. small. <laughs> Sent our kids to the same school. Mo, good to see you again. It's great to schmooze on the schmooze. Always great to schmooze in the schmooze. If anyone uh, will just kick us off, uh, I see Mo every single day for about a minute because Mo has a meaningful moment uh, on Duff Yomi with an inspiring message every minute. Uh, we'll be putting the uh, the link to sign up for that if you're interested uh, uh, on all of our various platforms. Make sure to check that out. Mo, um, I, I honestly, I don't even know where to begin because there's just so much we can talk schmooze about. There's just too much to schmooze about with you. Um, I think let's start with the present. No better place to start. What have you been up to nowadays? Where are you at? What's uh, what's going on with you now, uh, career-wise? Career-wise, you said what am I up to these days? I was about to answer that I try to be a good husband and a good dad to four young kids, and you know, get the career. Let's focus on you. What do I do? So often, <laughs> yeah, somebody like like what do you do? And they're like, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. And I'm like, what do you like? Who like what do you do? Like, I'm an investment banker. Well, like, what do you do? So, <laughs> how do we describe our essence? I'd like to think that I describe my essence as trying to be a good person. Anyways, professionally. Professionally, professionally, uh, you, you know, I spent about seven years in tech and startups, and just about a year and a half ago, I merged uh, into this world of Jewish nonprofit. Big passion has been to how do you take a lot of the the tech know how and how do you help the Jewish world in a much more scalable, impactful way. So, for instance, uh, you know, the I was the co-founder and CEO of a startup called Winfluencers right before I joined uh, in the Jewish nonprofit world, and I built a technology platform to facilitate influencers being connected to advertisers on social media. So it's a two-sided marketplace, advertisers and influencers on social, and how do they get branded deals and generate revenue? We had a lot of engagement there, but it wasn't it wasn't succeeding fast enough. I was never to do, raise more venture capital, nah, nah, nah. And the partners into our opportunity came up. It was a very poignant moment in my life. And the moment, uh, it, it, it seemed to be the right thing to do. Now, what, 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 the, you know, I was super intrigued by partners in Torah because it allows the opportunity for two people to connect. In a world where there's so much media and consumption, where we're spectators of so much, whether it's an experience, a summer camp, a trip, a movie, a video, a schmooze, allowing two people to connect and talk might sound so old school, but it's so powerful and so real. And the goal was how do we try to help the Jewish world connect in meaningful ways? Wow. I, I just, that, that point is so amazing, just about the two people uh, connecting, which is like media has become a spectator sport, like you were saying, like, and people just consume all day long. Where is the connection? Sorry, Daniel, I cut you off. No, it's, it's all good. I think it's exciting when people kind of get back to basics. You know, like what's the most powerful, even in education, when we talk about, you know, relaying a message, is the best way to do it over a screen or is the best way to do it in person, you know, building building on a relationship? And uh, I think that's, that's kind of lost on, on a lot. And that's kind of what the schmooze is about. It's kind of innovation it doesn't have to be, you know, the, mo- the flashiest thing or the most impressive, produ- impressively produced video. It can be the most simplistic and most effective way. So I'm excited. Mo, when you think about partners in Torah, I know entrepreneurship and, and innovation is definitely your realm. So why is it different? You know, I can list from here till next schmooze, um, and you're more than welcome back, 
but all the all the organizations that are focused on on bringing Torah to the masses, you know, really creating an easy, not non overwhelming, you know, a little commitment, like all these organizations that are trying to offer an opportunity to learn Torah, to connect to Torah. Why is partners in Torah different? Why is it something people should actively look into? Great question, Daniel. Let's just go back to a moment to what you said before about innovation and old school and two people connecting. Some of the most powerful and most successful technology startups today are those that are leveraging technology to create in-person experiences. So it's not about how do I create something new and digital and cool. Airbnb does not help you do something digital and cool. It helps you find somebody else's house to stay in. There's nothing techie about some, staying on somebody else's couch. There's nothing techie about being in some random guy's back seat of his car as he's taking you to the airport with Uber. There's nothing, but the, the facilitation of that experience was all tech enabled. And that's what we're looking to do. We're not looking to create a techie experience. People wouldn't look at us and say, wow, that's a techie company. But behind the back end, the infrastructure, the technology, the platform, there is hundreds of thousands of dollars we've already invested into creating scalable and more efficient experiences that can now reach millions of people. People won't say, oh, I had this really techy, powerful experience. But connecting two people is our goal. How do you connect two people? So let's say Daniel, right? I don't know. Are, are you single or are you married, Daniel? For now, I'm single. Uh, cool. I'll Sorry. be first. You heard it here first to the audience. That's <laughs> He is single. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you don't fall out the court, by the way. Daniel, I apologize. This I'm sorry. This has not come up yet. Thank you, Mo. You have met. This is now. Daniel, very eligible bachelor. I want to say, yeah, guys, yeah, I highly recommend you, Daniel. Right here, just moved to Israel. We should let all the girls know locally that Daniel has moved to Baca, and they should watch out. Okay. We will be Daniel. posting Daniel's full address and cell phone number on all of our platforms. <laughs> Wow, hey, it's always such a, this was a great last move. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, Mo, you're invited in any week, every week. That's it. <laughs> so Daniel, let's say you were meeting with a matchmaker, right? And they spend 20 minutes with you. Daniel, let's get to know you, Daniel. How you doing? What do you like to do? Whoa, is your advocacy? Whoa, Donald Trump's a fan of yours. Oh my gosh, you're the most eligible bachelor in Jerusalem, right? You're, that's how the conversation really? no, my, my, that's ladies, that's actually a conversation day. I had. True statement. Yeah, right. Okay. So if that would be the case, you know, there are, you know, there are dating apps now. I, I'm I'm not here to recommend any of them over the others, but I'm saying that there are dating apps. Maybe Dan, you look very surprised, happy to share with them afterwards what they are. But those dating apps facilitate experiences that are not techie experiences, but they can make a thousand matches or a million matches in a day because that's all being an Enabled. So what we did was with Partners in Torah, and I'll be very open here in this conversation as to how the organization was doing and how we're doing now, is we, the, or, the organization in years past, in the last couple of years, has matched about a thousand people per year. It matches people that have some Jewish education with those with less Jewish education. So about a um, thousand people, about 500 matches per year. Now that's nice and that works and that's great. And there's 500 matches, which is a thousand worlds and different things and all kinds of situations and follow up and content recommendations and every, there's a lot of work that goes into a thousand people every single year. But I came in so frustrated because how many Jewish organizations have the potential to reach millions of people? Either I'm high school students, I'm moms, I'm college kids, I deal with kids in Northern California, I'm Canada, I'm Eastern Europe, I'm Israel, I'm Tel Aviv, I'm, I'm men from, I don't know, everybody's got their own demographic and geographic, partners and tours, agnostic to all that. Anybody, all over the world, 18 plus, you got it, which means that the, the, the target market is millions of people. That's like unbelievable. So you're reaching a thousand people, which is cute, but you're not even touching the surface of what the opportunity is. How are you going to reach a million people potentially? So yeah. the goal right when we joined was how do you build a platform that can facilitate that kind of scale? And therefore, we invested a lot. We hired people from the tech world and we brought them in to create that kind of platform that I like to call it. I don't mean to be too edgy here. Feel free to <laughs> cut me right. off. Uh, I like to call it the Tinder for Torah. Less incredible. Incre that's the new hashtag. <laughs> no, don't make that the new hashtag. That's, <laughs> that's not a good idea. <laughs> Tinder for Torah, but that's that's I mean, I kind of that's what it is. You are matching yeah. people to learn Torah. Yeah, and really, what we're doing is actually beyond the Torah. The Torah is a great way to have icebreakers and conversation starters, but the real goal is to connect and to unite the Jewish world. 
because we get feedback all the time from people from every kind of community wearing everything and nothing, everybody. The ability to speak to people that are outside of our community, that don't look the same as us, that are from a different country, is so powerful. And while we like to think we're so open-minded and we often don't create relationships with those that are outside of our immediate circles. Right. Keep a meaningful conversation with people. Let me hear a different perspective, whether that be politics, whether it be approach to religion or approach to careers or parenting. And the relationships that result from weekly conversations is life-changing yeah. beyond the text that is actually being studied. Well, last week we had Nachum Siegel on. He would just come, up, come back from the UAE. And he was talking about this also. Like once you leave your community. And I mean, he's in the UAE talking with, you know, Arabs from the UAE and they're talking about the, the Dallas Cowboys. And like, you know, they're just, and he was, but he was saying like so much to learn from each other. Once you, a line I used to teach in, in one of my leadership seminars was, unity begins where your social circle ends. It's a playoff of uh, growth begins where your comfort zone ends. Unity yeah. begins where your social circle ends. And I just love this. It's such an easy way, an effective way, and authentic way of breaking out of our immediate circle. So, so you say, so you mentioned scalability. So, how has the scalability been going? What's what's that look like? Great question. So, we launched the platform a few months back, and it's great to see already this year. Like in the last eight months, we've uh, engaged about five thousand new participants in in the program. Wow. So, uh, annualized, that would be closer to seven and a half thousand, which means that we're looking at about seven seven, eight times growth year over year in the first year of the pilot launch. But I don't just want to talk about like, like quantitative metrics. It's very easy to get caught away in like vanity metrics. Like, oh my gosh, I got a thousand views on a video or I got a, you know, how many people might've joined, but what's the impact of that? Sorry, a billion views on the video. <laughs> the schmooze gets 1 billion views per, 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 per minute, actually, per minute. Per minute. Yeah, you know, we, per minute. Google is actually calling us later today. To know, the, the rule of lying is that you actually should make it seem a little bit feasible. Right. So that's why I said a minute. I know. Okay. A second. So you thought this through in advance is what you're saying. Exactly. And that was the result. Okay, great. All right, Mo, you were saying. <laughs> so, you know, we there's a high focus on satisfaction. Like, are people enjoying this? You know, you like to create products that people like. So, so often we might do things and just feel excited that it got many likes on Facebook or it got people tuned in for three seconds for a good Facebook view. But what does that really mean? So we've seen that there's about an 89% satisfaction rate of participants in the program. We're not at 100 and we strive for more. But as we've scaled all this over the course of the last eight months, we've also been able to create a very high level of satisfaction. We've been providing content. Something that's so powerful actually is that we did our pilot launch in March, April, when we first opened up our platform, which is right when this lockdown and pandemic was hitting strong. And the messages that have been coming through are not even about the Torah study as much as it's been about people that have been gaining so much from having deep and meaningful relationships and conversations from a woman who told us that she was even <clears throat> high levels of anxiety or even suicide and her partner been able to provide her so much companionship and support. Many people that are just really, <clears throat> sorry, it's, 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 it's so powerful to be able to facilitate those kinds of experiences facilitated by technology without technology being like mm. front and center for the consumer. Incredible. Okay. Wow. So those are, those are very real metrics. Do you struggle with fighting? Like does, does, is quality potentially sacrificed as you're trying to scale and how do you, how do you go about, you know, mitigating that? Daniel, your question is what we discuss, if not on a daily basis, at least a weekly basis. Like, how okay. do you go the line between growth? First of all, how do you define every organization, every person also, but every organization should have a goal. What is my goal? What am I trying to accomplish? Everybody needs a goal. If we don't have goals, we're shooting in the dark, right? Akiva, clearly you hope to get a trillion views on the schmooze. And you hope to be the top rated YouTube video, like, you know, in the next, right? The next awesome. day or two. Right now, Mahon Mayan is your sponsor, and that's phenomenal, phenomenal seminary. All okay. girls should go to Mahon Mayan. And next, you'll have, uh, let you know, Apple. Well, Mahon Mayan, it doesn't get higher. It doesn't get better than Mahon Mayan. This is that, that is actually true. That is actually true. Fantastic. So there's, if an organization is clear about what their goals are, 
That could be quantity. That could be quality. It could be some sort of combination of the two. But then everything that an organization does should follow suit. So we're creating right now the OKRs for the year. What is our North Star metric? What are the key results? What are objectives? How do we get there? Because there are so many different things that we could do in the year ahead. We have people calling us all the time. Why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? I have a great idea. And what, da, 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 da. there's a hundred ideas we have on the drawing board. The question is, which ones do we go after? They're all good. They're all helping the Jewish world. It's all great stuff. But if we don't have a clear roadmap of where we're trying to get to, then many of them could be a distraction. So when you ask about is quantity versus quality, I turn the question back to you. The question is really, what is the goal? If our goal is quantitative metrics that we're trying to hit, then we have to try to catch up as much as we, we can with quality. If the goal is qualitative metrics and as many as people as we, so it really depends how that works. And for us, we're actually really hard trying to toe the line between the two. And we've actually been struggling with this, which one is on a higher rung. We feel actually great and deep sense of responsibility to leverage the platform to reach many, 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 if not tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Jews, as I mentioned before, with this type of scalable approach to Jewish connection and personalized Jewish learning, any subject, any time, through the comfort of your own home. And we've just actually built a whole deeper integration with Google to allow facilitate every single person has their own links and video. Like the whole, like we're doing more and more to build out the technology behind it. But um, we're, we, we have a lot of effort in the hiring that we've done and the technology that we're building to ensure the experiences that those people are having are going to be very enjoyable and qualitative experiences. I'll tell you something very cool. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this publicly. Let's find out. But I'll well, say it. Okay, we go for it. I'll try to be a little bit vague. But, you know, our, we're, we're exploring the model of actually spinning out what we're doing and servicing other organizations because the technology platform that we've built to facilitate user onboarding, smart algorithm-based matching, content delivery, facilitation of the connection with API and data that tracks everything can be packaged and licensed to other organizations. So we're actually right now in a pilot for a very large foundation uh, to facilitate, I'll try to be vague, but to facilitate connections for their participants. And we are, it's powered by Partners in Torah. So we are the technology player under the hood of a very large project, of a very prestigious project that's taking place. And we're that platform under the hood. And we're exploring right now whether we'll spin this whole thing out, create another B2B arm, and just start to power multiple other organizations' efforts. Because take an organization like NCSY, for instance, right? Like they, they, they might be tens of thousands of people being reached, but the one-on-one -on -one connection or scaling that is a difficult thing to do. And there's no easy technology that can help you. Right. You would be the, right. The Tinder for Toro. That's what you are. You're going to be right. able to insert your technology and your, and your, and your, your strong vision. that's already being executed successfully with you guys for anyone and everyone who wants to get involved. Uh, okay, I had mentioned the objectives and key results. Just a book, it's good, the book is called Measure What Matters by John Dewar. Highly recommend, incredible book on a business level or on a personal level for anyone who's looking to make sustained and real growth in your personal organizational life. Um, right, 100%. I think also, you know, we, we talk about all the time, at Donnie Locker a couple of weeks ago, he's the director of Camp Nagila West. When, when we were talking about competition, you know, like we're all, we're all in the same game here. Like we're all on the same ship. It's not a. It's not about competition. We wanna. We all have specific assets to bring to the table. And I. I love the partnership. You know that. And Moa, you're you're in the unique position to build out strategically and and bring all the appropriate tools. And I think that you know when we talk about innovation in the Jewish world, that's innovative. You know, like we have plenty of like we said before, plenty of organizations have teachers and are prepared to talk about Torah and all these things. But you're putting a package together. It's powered by Partners in Torah. Partners in Torah doesn't need to be the the focus. It's it's about helping the Jewish people. I think I think that's incredible. I, I, that. I, I actually think that it's a detriment if we were the brand, which means that there are and I'm not going to name organizations, but think five or ten organizations that that you know of very well, whether it's Israel Advocacy or what any sort of vertical in Jewish education is that if we'd be the brand, we're not the trusted consumer brand. Another organization already is. They've all already invested into that community. It wouldn't be right for us to come in and say, come on, Israel Advocacy by us. So if we can facilitate that connection. One of the deep passions they had coming into this, it's not a revenue game. It's not a revenue game like how can we make more money? 
how can we make a bigger impact for the Jewish world? So again, if our goal is how can we facilitate deep human connection, relationship, and growth in terms of some form of Jewish learning in any sort of vertical or subject, so that enables us to power other organizations' success and not feeling like they're taken away from us. There's millions of people, there's a lot of opportunity, and a big dream I have, I don't know if I'll be able to achieve this goal, is to power five, 10 other organizations to be able to much more deeply achieve what they can to deeply impact their individual constituents to connect them in much more meaningful ways than they currently are, especially during a pandemic right. when trips and in-person Shabbatonim and conferences aren't happening. Mo, it's it's so inspiring to, to, to hear what you're doing, to hear your dreams and your goals and your aspirations. I think we have maybe like a one and a half minutes left. Um, uh, is that I think that's, that's, that's okay. That's all we've got left. Um, thank you for coming on. I, I want to I wanna end off with one question, if that's okay. You, and I don't even know what to pick from in my head. Um, I guess the question would be, is if you had a message, you know, Daniel and I both work with Jewish teens. So this one's going to be for the Jewish teenager, okay, ages 10 to 18, okay? I know you've done acting in the past, and you've acted with Drake, and you and you have people, you have celebrities on your show. I'm going to ask you, and here's, here's my, my question to you, okay? How would you advise a Jewish teen to achieve happiness. In one minute or less, please. <laughs> what is your advice? I'll keep talking while you think about that. You know, we're always, this is happiness. Well, everyone wants to be happy. It always seems to be elusive. There's always this constant, you know, chasing a happiness. What's, what am I looking for? The, the pursuit of happiness. What would you advise to a Jewish teen in a, in a world of a pandemic where things are confusing and Everything we hear in the news is confusing and values seem to be very confusing nowadays. It used to be, I feel like it used to be a lot more black and white. Well, maybe one or two sentences on that to the Jewish teenager of today. Love the question, Rabbi Kiva. It's a very powerful challenge to try to put this into one minute. It's a subject that I've spent years and years thinking about. I was a very unhappy teenager, to be quite open and honest with you. I was not happy. I was quite unhappy as a teenager. And so often we shoot to be happy. We strive to be happy. We strive to be happy. Happiness is the goal. Ask anybody what your goals. We all want to be happy. What's fascinating, what's fascinating is that in Judaism, our goal is not really to be, there's no mitzvah to be happy. What happiness is a byproduct of leading an awesome life. If our goal is to be happy, we're shooting after consuming pleasure and short-term things that make us feel good, but ultimately won't make us really deeply, meaningfully happy. If we strive to become the best version of ourselves and push ourselves and grow, let me ask every one of you watching the show, when you do yoga or exercise or do sports, that hard feeling... How good do you feel? Not just after the yoga or not just after the exercise, but when your muscles are killing you, how great do you feel? If we know what we're doing, we talk about OKRs and organizational goals, it all sounds so big. But if we have personal goals to try to achieve certain wonderful things, steps at a time, get good grades in high school, go to a good college, we spend a year in Israel, at Mahon Mayan if you're a girl or somewhere else if you're a guy, spend, and then go to, to do great things, be a great Israel, whatever, there's so many great things to do, but step by step to do great things, and we're, we feel like we're becoming the best people that we could be, we will be happy as a result of leading an awesome life. But if we're so shooting for happiness, then we're gonna take it from all the wrong directions and really be depressed. So. Life is awesome. Take advantage of it. Be you. Be you. The more we scroll through Instagram and TikTok, the more we are unhappy with ourselves often. Let's try to focus more on ourselves and how amazing God created us with our unique strengths, with our unique abilities, and take advantage of the beauty of every day of life and become the best people we could be. And as a result, I assure you that every one of you will be much happier. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Mo. Mo. You, you, have you ever been on tour? Because I think that's what's next. Usually I always ask what's next, but I'm telling you, you should go on tour. Mo. Uh, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Mo. It was a pleasure schmoozing with you. I definitely don't know anything about happiness during yoga, but everything else really spoke to me. And thank you for coming on the show. We can't wait to schmooze with you again, see what, what the updates with partners in Torah. 
and all the other amazing uh, initiatives you're involved with. Thank you again, and we cannot wait. Well, close eyes will be on on Mo Mernick and all he has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Rivik. Keep it great to smooth with you guys, and keep on rocking it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and although that is absolutely our automatic response for bring the show back after after <laughs> uh, it's it's incredible to and I this is really what I love about time. the show. I love loud every time, but this is really what I love about the schmooze that we're able to see these people who you might not know about. Yeah, like Mo, it happens to be in, in like the Jewish circles has made a name for himself, but only some Jewish circles, you know, and to be able to see that everybody has the ability to bring their skill set, you know, going back to our conversation on soul, really finding your passion, finding your purpose and, and b making a better world, you know, inspiring others. And that's something Mo does every day. So, so thankful for him to being on. I, I'm, I'm going to take that message about happiness with me. Really yeah. every day. I love that he said happiness is not the goal, it's a byproduct. You know, yeah, I think that that is absolutely something and it's a message because every every day I'm getting called. It's very, it's like if you want to tear Korea, like you wanna it's it's heart wrenching. But I'm getting calls every day about students who are depressed, anxious, you know, they're they're just living in, in an environment that is so not healthy for them and they just like I just wanna be happy. I just wanna be happy. Like, okay, you're not happiness isn't the goal, it's a byproduct. You know, and it's it's incredible. Uh. Thank you, Mo. Thank you again to our sponsor, Machol Mayan, uh, uh, for sponsoring today's episode of The Schmooze. Again, for any um, female seniors out there, or if you know any, make sure to check out Machol Mayan. Check out their website. Uh, they have something for everyone. It's just an incredible place, like we said earlier on the show. Last week, we discussed the following question. If you were at a barber, and I said this is my nightmare, still is. If you're at a barber and they shave off one... <laughs> half of your of your sideburns which if you're a dude you're not supposed to shave off totally um by accident what are you supposed to do you're you're like you know by the way this didn't exactly happen to me but one time before my last day of work at nefesh benefesh i interned there one summer my mom works there for many years uh and i interned there over the summer one time and right before it was like the, my last day was the day after the three weeks so i was able to kind of you know get a haircut and the guy, a friend of mine does those haircuts, and he forgot to put on, no, it was an old uh, shaver kit, uh, what, what do you call it, thingy? And um, Clippers. What is it? Clippers. Clippers, and the piece fell off, but he didn't notice, and he goes like this to start, and I had a zero, all this was a zero and 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 the rest i just did like a two or a three i didn't want to do my whole head zero and i looked i looked ridiculous i looked dude oh no excuse me it wasn't here it was here so it wasn't so bad it was in the back but it was still ridiculous it was still ridiculous i looked insane anyways um my, i asked the rabbi i'm sure you'll get different opinions he said that if that happens and one half gets shaved off with 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 scissors or with, meaning not with a razor but with uh, an electric shaver which is normally what they're using then he said, if you wouldn't truly, if you would truly be embarrassed to go out, right? Like, cause you're going to look ridiculous. Then he would say it's okay. As long as again, it's not with a razor, be, uh, so just with, you know, the, uh, the shit an electric shaver. Cause that isn't cutting them actually. It's not taking the hair out from underneath the skin. It's just shaving it down kind of just very, very, very small. And he said, in the case of Kavoda Briot, an English that's uh Kavoda Brios. Which means, uh, which means that uh, you know, uh, respect for for humanity. And you're no, you're 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 not. You're human. You're human, and so therefore you fall into that as well. And if you're going to be embarrassed, you can't embarrass other people, and you also can't embarrass yourself. By the way, you can't speak lashon hara about other people, and you also can't speak lashon hara about yourself. Um, and so he said he would he would say to be lenient in such a case, which I thought was very interesting. Um, I'm sure other rabbis would say no, but I would now say yes, because I always go for a lenient opinion if, poss if possible, when possible. Um, question for next week. Yeah, you should qualify that statement that that is not advised. Like you don't just pick leniency every time, Thank especially you. with Jewish law. What I meant was in a case of where someone's feelings might get hurt, including your own, if one can be lenient, one should be lenient. That is that okay. thing. That, that's good. That's what I meant. Um, um, no, it's, it's very important. You can't just pick and choose leniencies, and, and I don't. Um, um, but question for next week is as follows. And I'm, we're really curious. If this has happened to you, comment on uh, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Let us know if this has happened to you. We're really actually genuinely, authentically curious. Um, if, certainly if you're a Jewish teen or uh, were once a Jewish teen or are going to be a Jewish teen. If you fall into any of the three categories, let us know. Um, have you ever have you ever needed to take a test 
on Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah or any other Jewish holiday that you're in, you know, if it's middle school, high school or college and the teacher's like, listen, that's when the test is like, you know, and uh, what do you do? Are you allowed to take the test? What do you do if they're not being flexible about it? Uh, we're really curious to hear if you've had that before and what you've done. And we'll uh, see you next Shmooze to discuss it more. Akiva, it's been a pleasure schmoozing with you. Great having Mo on the show. It's great always.